Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Fall 2021 Colloquium Series. Uh, we are so excited to have you all here today. My name is Tyrone Bass, and I'm a senior fellow at Hughside Institute. Uh, a few operational notes. At the end of this session, we'll adjourn to a standard Zoom meeting for an informal cocktail coffee hour where we can chat more informally with one another. Uh, we'd also like to encourage any of you who are joining us today who are not officially members of our affiliate program or our consortium to consider joining. The affiliate program is free to join. The consortium program is a paid membership, although anyone who's wishing to join can apply for a scholarship if budgets are tight. Link to those are on the screen and I'll include them in the meeting chat after the introduction. Uh, today's colloquium is the second installment in the exciting programming we have planned for the 21-22 academic year. Our colloquium series features nine fantastic speakers who will discuss issues related to theory, activism, and technical tools to shed light on a broad range of topics related to inclusion, diversity, equity, and social justice. Uh, please visit our colloquium webpage and consider where registering for and sharing information about the other talks we have planned with colleagues who may be interested. Uh, also, if you have not done so yet, uh, please remember to register for the Datathon for Justice happening October 22nd to 24th, 2021. Uh, please encourage your students to participate as well. Individuals from all technical abilities are welcome. This year's theme is criminal justice, and we already have more than 100 participants from over 20 institutions of higher learning and mission-driven organizations. Uh, if you would like to support QSIDE in the production of more exciting research and activism initiatives, uh, we graciously appreciate any and all donations made to our organization. Your support keeps us going. As we progress through our session today, we welcome questions for our speaker using the Q&A feature of the webinar. Keep in mind your questions will only be visible to the host and speaker and we'll have time at the end of the presentation for some answers. And now it's my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Molly Coleman, co-founder and first executive director of the People's Parity Project. Uh, a graduate of Harvard Law School, Molly Coleman has worked for a number of legal organizations committed to advancing social justice, including Gender Justice, Legal Voice, the Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee, the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office, and the Fair Labor Division of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. Uh, she also served as Editor-in-Chief of the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, Prior to law school, Molly spent three years with City Year New York, working to close the opportunity gap for students in Harlem and the Bronx and to empower young people to become civically engaged leaders. She's a University of Wisconsin, Madison, and a native of St. Paul, Minnesota. Her service mission centers on aiding those systematically underrepresented and overrepresented in our judicial system and trying to create justice for those most in need of it. Our talk with Molly Coleman today will explore how our judicial system came to be, what the consequences have been, and what one potential way forward might look in the face of a rigged legal system. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tyrone. Um, I'm really excited to be here today, really excited to be chatting with all of you. I am going to warn you in advance, as those who were here and heard me talking to Jude earlier, I'm horrible with technology. I'm not going to be able to see anything. So if there are urgent questions, like, I don't know, somebody unmute yourself and, and stop me from rambling on. Um, I am now going to do the hardest maneuver of the day and share my screen and see if we can manage this all at once. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see. Let me know if you can't. You're not in uh, presentation mode, Molly. You were before, but now we can see your notes. And I just want you to be aware. It, it works fine. We can certainly see it. As long as you can't see it, my, uh, my actual notes, I think this is going to work better. Well, perfect. So <laughs> um, like I said, apologies for my tech skills. Anyway, before I get started, just wanted to say a huge thank you to Chad, Jude, Tyrone, the entire QSide team. I'm really just from you know the first time that I encountered QSide, Really, really excited about the work that's happening here and very honored to be a part of the colloquium. 
So like Tyrone mentioned, I'm here today to talk about three, three ideas. The first is the extent to which the civil legal system is rigged against workers, consumers, and you know, sort of everyday people. The second, and kind of where my organizing and activism lives is the role that the legal profession, particularly legal elites have played in rigging this system, rigging our civil legal system so that it serves to benefit almost exclusively their corporate clients. And then finally, I'm going to end with a conversation and kind of where I hope we can go in the Q&A and the conversation afterwards about the movement that I believe is needed to restore balance to our, our so-called justice system, if we want it to actually live up to its name. So I wanted to start today with this quote that I love from Jose Antonio Vieira Gallo. Um, I will, oh, I also should have given you all this warning at the outset. You'll see that I'm not really a visual learner. So I do have slides and they're very text heavy. Don't feel the need to read them. I'll give you the gist uh, as I'm talking. So my starting premise for this conversation and for the work that I do is that the law is not and cannot be separated from politics. It never has been, it never will be. It doesn't mean that there isn't an important role to be played by our legal system. It doesn't mean that our judiciary is completely unnecessary, but it does mean that ceding the power of the people to unelected and unaccountable politicians in robes should give us all immense pause. And as this quote so perfectly puts it, the law expresses not just a vision of society, but the groups behind this vision and the interests served by conceiving the society in that particular form. Many of the harms that we are all collectively facing today um, and that I will be talking about at length this afternoon are because we've allowed the Supreme Court, which is a body that nobody voted for, in which five members were appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote, and one third of the ruling cohort has been credibly accused of sexual assault or sexually harassment. That body, that Supreme Court is dictating the terms of our society. For the most part, this has been allowed to happen with the absolute acquiescence of both political parties and virtually all of the country's elites and without any concentrated opposition from the progressive movement. My argument today is that this has resulted in a moment of judicial crisis for this country, particularly when it comes to our civil legal system, and that the people paying the price for that are those most vulnerable in this country. So on that super cheery note, I hope you're all like really stoked for a really fun chat um, and let's dive in. Introduction, have you heard about the Supreme Court lately? I am sorry that we live in a world in which you certainly have, because it means that they're playing an outside role in what's happening. Um, so I'm guessing it's an easy answer to this uh, section's header. Quick overview of where I'm planning to go over the next half hour, 45 minutes. Quick intro, and a conversation about who are the actors here, right? This is not a passive situation. There are folks, there are entities, there are powerful organizations who have made it their life's work to rig the civil legal system. So we're gonna spend some time getting to know those folks. Then, and most importantly, what are the real world consequences of a rigged civil legal system? As a recent law school graduate, as a lawyer, I find that far too often these conversations about the court, about our justice system happen without ever talking about what it means for real people. It's treated as an academic exercise. And, and as I'll discuss today, I think that part of our job as folks who care about building a better world has to be centering the folks who are most impacted by the courts in these conversations. Then we'll talk about what's been done, if anything, spoiler, not much, to try to unrig it. And then, like I said, closing with, with a proposal, what do we do when we're 50 years behind the ball? So, as I said, have you heard about the Supreme Court lately? I have been finding in my work that after a year of living underneath a far right Federalist Society dominated Supreme Court, it's unfortunately getting quite a bit easier to pretty quickly convince folks that the court, at least as it's currently constructed, isn't exactly serving the interests of the vast majority of the American people. These are all, um, if you are a New York Times reader, you'll recognize their font, all ripped from the web pages of the Times. 
And this is just the last year, and this is the number of headlines that I could put on one slide. But to quickly walk through, because I think it can be easy in, in the moment that we're living in to lose track of all that has happened. So it was less than a year ago that Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed to the Supreme Court in the middle of an election. It was completely unprecedented. Millions of ballots had already been cast. Um, and because of an untimely death and a legal system that is you know, at the whims and mercy of, of a few octogenarians, we found ourselves in a whole new world. This meant that we had a 6-3 court. It is the furthest right that the court has been, certainly in my lifetime and, and in the lifetime of any anybody on this call. There's, there's no way you have lived through a more conservative Supreme Court. Um, it's it's historic in in how far right it is and how far how out of step it is with the vast majority of the public. What has what has that looked like in just a year? It's meant that we had Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. So that was the case decided early. I was going to say earlier this summer. Over the summer, it's no longer summer. Uh, about um, adoption agencies and the ability of gay couples to adopt children. The holding of this case um, was that the private Catholic adoption agency was entitled to have its contract with the city renewed. Um, that contract allowed it to screen foster parents, despite the fact that that adoption agency violated city law by refusing to consider married LGBTQ couples. When this decision first came out, some of you might remember it was sort of treated as a win because it could have been worse, right? It was it was a unanimous decision. And so people were like, well, if Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan agreed to this, maybe it's not so bad, which just goes to show you how, how far the bottom has fallen. Um, it was a narrow decision. It was a relatively narrow decision. But first and foremost, it foreshadows that we have what well, we have good reason to believe is coming, which is a court dedicated to so-called freedom of religion above all other rights protections. Um, I wanna read a quote from Dr. Jeremy Kohumban, who's the president and CEO of the Children's Village and the national co-chair of the Children Need Amazing Parents campaign. After the ruling in Fulton came out, Dr. Kohumban wrote, in a city like Philadelphia, the Supreme Court ruling likely won't have much impact. There are countless other organizations, including re reputable faith-based organizations, which will continue to certify LGBTQ plus families as foster parents. The question is, what happens in smaller communities where the entire foster system is dependent on one organization if that organization chooses to discriminate? What could happen in rural America if the only organization serving the community chooses to discriminate as Catholic Social, social Services of Philadelphia has? So once again, let's who are the real people impacted in this case, right? It's the families who want to adopt, who want to bring children into their lives. It's the children who want to be adopted by a loving family and no longer have that opportunity. And, and so the notion that we're celebrating this as a unanimous win or a narrow holding, not as bad as it could have been, it I think goes to show how, how soulless this entire conversation around the courts has quickly become. Around the same time that Fulton was decided, we had Brnovich versus the Democratic National Committee. So that was the case regarding Arizona voting restrictions. And it effectively dismantled the, the, the little, the crumbs that were left of the Voting Rights Act. As Supreme Court commentator Mark Joseph Stern said, for years, courts have interpreted the relevant test, in this case, the results test of the VRA, which was enacted by Congress. For years, courts have interpreted this test to mean what it says a law that disproportionately burdens racial minorities access to the ballot violates the Voting Rights Act. But in this ruling, Samuel Alito, one of the furthest right members of the current court, held that voter suppression laws with a disproportionate impact on racial minorities are apparently not inherently unlawful. As long as people of color have some other way to vote, at least in theory, even if not in practice, even if not an equal opportunity to vote, it's all good. Law is fine. And I will say, and, and it's I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody here, but some of the most consistent decisions outside of the corporate realm, which we'll spend most of today talking about, have been a refusal to uphold voting rights and equal voting access. And, and when we talk about the anti-democratic nature of this court, it's 
it's overwhelming um, the extent to which it is it is opposed to voting. And frankly, anybody who has studied the 2000 election, who remembers the 2000 election, it shouldn't be a surprise. This court for decades has been opposed to democratic expression of political preference. So that's all fun and good. Next, a case that flew a little bit more under the radar, I think, than the last two, Cedar Point Nursery versus Hasid. So this was a case about whether union representatives are able to go on to you know, where the workers are, are able to meet the workers where they're at, at work, and bring them into the union, chat about union support, recruit them for the union. The Supreme Court ruled that this was an unconstitutional taking of property, which if anybody is eager to chat about that, would love to. Um, it's an incredibly alarming decision as Nico Bowie, a Harvard Law professor has discussed extensively. It's, um, it's really troubling precedent. There is reason to believe that this ruling could be used to mean that the state can't require that uh, restaurants allow health inspectors onto their property, that employers allow health and safety um, inspectors onto their property, that all of this would violate a, a property rights violation for the employer. Um, really, really troubling. And without even going into what we expect will come as a result of this decision, it's a slap in the face to, to labor. It makes it immensely difficult to organize folks in hard to reach places like on farms in rural areas in California and, and you know, makes very clear that the Supreme Court is in the pocket of big business, corporate America. And then these last three headlines, these have been in the news in the last six weeks. If folks have been following the shadow docket, um, we saw the Supreme Court revive the Remain in Mexico or Migrant Protection Protocols, which effectively was the Supreme Court writing immigration policy, writing foreign relationship policy, foreign relations policy, um, and, and actively, again, actively harming the lives of people who come to the United States seeking a better life. Nobody elected the Supreme Court, but they are deciding who has a right to enter the United States. Uh, they ended Biden's eviction moratorium, throwing the futures of hundreds of thousands of people into jeopardy who might not be able to stay in their home in the midst of an ongoing pandemic. And perhaps most um, in the most high profile shadow docket decision, refusing to block Texas's abortion law, meaning that Texas is no longer accessible for millions of pregnant people in Texas. It's been a really, really hard couple of months it's been a hard year, um, but the last six weeks for folks who have been following the court, I think it's just, it's pretty impossible to overstate how bad things are. And, and there's no reason to think it will get better anytime soon. With the new Supreme Court term that begins on Monday, God help us all, we're preparing for the conservative majority to over, officially overturn or for all intents and purposes overturn Roe to prevent the state from being able to protect us from gun violence by outlawing concealed carry laws. Um, it's gonna be a year of blockbuster cases. And like I said, barring some extraordinary changes, we can expect that the court will continue to come, to continue to act in this way, but also hopefully motivate the progressive community to do what it has failed to do for so long and finally care about the courts and recognize the threat that they pose to our democracy, to our rights, to our ability to organize, to our ability to protect ourselves and much more. So the one, I'd argue this is a good thing. Um, a number of law professors would disagree with me. The public is getting the message that the Supreme Court is standing in the way of progress, is getting the message that the Supreme Court is prepared to roll back decades of hard-won rights. The court's approval is dropping pretty quickly. It's generally, it's been a source of immense frustration for me that the court consistently has pretty high approval ratings, even among progressives, even on the left. Um, but as we can see in recent polling from Gallup, um, Marquette has also found similar, similar approval trends with the court. Um, people see what's up. People see that this is a stolen court, that it's an illegitimate court, and that if we don't, if we don't do something, nothing else is going to matter because this court will impede progress every step of the way. One thing that I want to stress here as we think about kind of 
current lay of the land, Supreme Court, what's going on. Right now we have a 6-3 conservative court. Everybody here knows that. And I've been starting to hear this, well, what does it matter if it's a 7-2 court? You know, it can't get any worse than this. And, and one thing I want to stress, and I think has to be key to how we talk about the court is that it can get worse. We, it, I wish we were at the bottom, we're not. If we find ourselves at a 7-2 court where instead of Brett Kavanaugh as the swing justice, which is the position he currently finds himself in, we have Neil Gorsuch as the swing justice, we're going to find that the cases that are brought before the court, so the decisions made, are going to be even worse than they are now. All that a party needs to prevail in the court is five votes. And if they can lose Kavanaugh, if they can, <laughs> we're going to be in a far different place than we are now. Um, for a while, we had John Roberts kind of holding the middle. There was some hope for progress there. We don't have that now. Um, it, it's bad, but it, but it could get worse. And again, happy to talk about this more at the end. So hopefully if you haven't um, just like crawled under your desk and started crying, you're still with me um, and at least somewhat persuaded that the majority of Americans who now have an unfavorable opinion of the Supreme Court might be onto something here. And I will say we haven't even gotten into what the lower courts are doing, what the district courts are doing, what the circuit courts are doing. Those decisions can have nearly as much harm as what the Supreme Court does, but we don't have all day. So I'm going to move past that um, for now. So what I want to turn to next is how. How did we get here? Who are the actors who envisioned this world, who brought us to this moment, who decided that this is their ideal society and that they would stop at nothing to achieve it? For my starting point for today, I'm going to focus on the 1970s and 80s. This is certainly not the only place we could start. Um, there's been a long history of the Supreme Court impeding progress. Look no further than the New Deal era or watering down progressive legislation. There's a long history um, and some really fantastic research into how the court undercut the Wagner Act, prevented you know, our hopes of unionizing America from achieving Congress's ideal. Why I choose to start in the 70s and 80s is that my focus is on the coordinated effort to capture the judiciary, not individual justices or judges, not you know on times when there were some pro-corporate judges and some anti-worker judges. My, that's fine and good and an important history, but what we'll see and what I hope to show today is that starting just after mid-century, we had an unprecedented effort to undermine, undermine the judiciary as it was constructed at the time. So again, happy for pushback later on and would love to start this earlier at some future presentation. So the Powell Memo. The first entity that I think you can't have a conversation about who rigged the courts without talking about the Chamber of Commerce and other pro-corporate forces. This is, I think, something that we kind of take for granted that, of course, the Chamber of Commerce was always litigating. Of course, business entities were always trying to shape what happened in the court. And, and that might be true to some extent, but certainly not in the coordinated way that we've seen over the last 50 years since the Powell Memo was written. So what is the Powell Memo? Powell was an attorney in Virginia. He was a corporate attorney. He represented you know, the big tobacco companies, Philip Morris, whatnot. Um, he, just two months after this memo was written, was appointed to the Supreme Court, and we'll talk a bit about what that has meant. Um, but he was sort of a, a classic corporate lawyer. People loved him. People saw him as, as really neutral, sort of a nobody can tell his politics. He had some, when he was on the bench, he had some good decisions. He had some progressive, I should say progressive decisions. He had some conservative decisions, mixed bag. What people don't talk about, and I, um, I excerpted from his um, eulogy obituary in the Washington Post, people don't talk about the fact that he was on a pro-corporate crusade his entire time as both an attorney and as a Supreme Court justice. That isn't treated as something that gives us insight into his politics. And this is 
a trend that we'll continue to see through through kind of this history, through this conversation, is that being pro-corporate as a judge, as a lawyer, is seen as an ideologically neutral position in a way that being pro-life or pro-choice or pro-gun control or anti-gun control really isn't. And I think a huge reason for that is the corporate takeover of the judiciary. So when Powell was president of the American Bar Association, he was asked by Eugene Snyder, Sidner, something like that, who is the education director for the National Chamber of Commerce to write a memo about how to, how to respond to the attacks on corporate America. Um, as former Deputy Assistant AG Attorney General Lisa Graves explained, um, kind of the context for this memo, it was, quote, a response to a brief period in US history where Americans were having increasing influence on our public policy. The post robber Barron era with the rise of the New Deal and then the civil rights movement's efforts in the 50s and 60s to have the 14th Amendment mean what it says. There was the rising environmental movement in the United States and there were efforts by Rolf Nader to ensure that products like cars were safe. There was a period where the federal government and state governments were more responsive to the interests of ordinary people. And that was intolerable to people like Powell who served corporate and right-wing interests. The architecture set forth in that memo has had a profoundly distorting effect on American democracy. So this memo, it's long, it's exhaustive. I can drop a link in the chat once I'm done talking. Um, it's a huge sob story. It is somebody playing the world's smallest violin about how people like Ralph Nader are coming for, for everything we believe in, for the very fabric of American life by saying things like, cars should have seatbelts and they should be safe. And what are we going to do to fight back? How are we going to reclaim corporate America's rightful place in society? And what Powell concluded was that, quote, strength lies in organization, in careful long range planning and implementation, in consistency of action over an, in, over an indefinite period of years, in the scale of financing available only through joint effort, and in the political power available only through united action and national organizations. And where he saw as an as kind of the pinnacle of potential for corporate America to engage in this careful, long-range planning was the courts. He understood that, as you can see on the slide, under our constitutional system, especially with an activist-minded Supreme Court, the judiciary may be the most important instrument for social, economic, and political change. The judiciary may be the most important instrument for social, economic, and political change. He was not talking about going through the democratically elected branches of government to achieve corporate America's interests. He was talking about taking over the judiciary, using the judiciary to enact a pro-corporate policy, regardless of what the people wanted. The consequences of this can't be overstated. It is why we are where we are today. It is, you know, this man, two months after writing this, was nominated to the Supreme Court. He served for 16 years. In one of his opinions, the First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, he laid the groundwork for Citizens United, which was the case that stands for the idea that corporations are people. He distorted precedent up until this point. He, he did whatever he could to make sure that corporate America would win. And he also set in place the Chamber of Commerce's next 50 years in which they multiplied their political operations, created a little litigation center, and now win seven out of every 10 cases that the chamber brings to the Supreme Court. And this was, this was before sort of the even further right push of the court over the last couple of years. They were winning 70% of their cases. I bring all this up in part because I think it's key to the history and in part because I think it really highlights the fact that it doesn't have to be this way. Powell created this world, the Chamber of Commerce created this world, um, but it wasn't an inevitability. It was a coordinated effort by a bunch of rich privileged attorneys and big business to, to take over our judiciary. And we are now all living with the consequences. So the next sort of who rigged the court who rigged the civil legal system is a group that I'd imagine many of you are familiar with, the Federalist Society. I'm not going to spend as long here. Um, I think that with Trump's fealty to the Federalist Society, they've kind of come up onto everybody's radar in a way that they weren't five or six years ago. 
But the quick and dirty overview is it is an organization that started as a student group in 1982 at Yale Law School and the University of Chicago. Um, they, they kind of saw Brown v. Board of Education and Roe v. Wade as this progressive glory moment on the Supreme Court. And they felt like as conservative students, they had been marginalized, that their voices weren't respected on campus and that they needed a place to, to have their ideas be heard. Their original faculty advisor was Antonin Scalia, um, who you all know ended up being appointed to the Supreme Court. It is now one of the most influential organizations in American society. They have tens of thousands of members, people in the highest level of governments, it, that in the highest level of government, um, both in the executive branch during Republican administrations in Congress, and most notoriously, it, they control six of the nine seats on the Supreme Court. So unlike past conservative justices, every single conservative justice now has ties to the Federalist Society. Um, they, and I should say, it's not just the Supreme Court, it's 90% of Trump's picks for the appellate courts were Federalist Society judges. It is, I mean, when it comes to Republican appointed judges, it is now and has been since the early years of the Bush administration, Trump uh, Federalist Society judges are bust. I wanna quickly point to Senator Sheldon Whitehouse's sort of notion of the three Federalist Societies, the three ways in which they engage with the public. So the first is the on-campus version of the Federalist Society. They'll often say that this is a debating group, right? If you've been to law school or know folks in law school, you'll know that the Federalist Society puts on a lot of lunches. Um, at least at Harvard, where I went, they always bought Chick-fil-A for lunch because wanted to own the libs. And, you know, they talk about everything from why George Washington wanted us all to have an AK-47 to why freedom of religion should trump every other right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they claim it's a debating society. They bring in a liberal voice to counteract their three or four conservative panelists. Really, it's a, it's a place to build a pipeline. It's a place where folks are able to network, to move um, forward in their careers, um, and really a home for conservative and libertarian leaning students on campus. The second, Federalist Society, as Senator Whitehouse describes it, is as a conservative think tank. So this is where they have fancy forums where they invite Supreme Court justices with Federalist Society ties to speak, um, where they put out newsletters and podcasts and policy recommendations sort of in a outside of the system, not whispering in the president's ear, but you know, outside of the system way of talking about it. And then third and most egregiously is, is what Sheldon Whitehouse calls creatively the third Federalist Society. So as he describes this quote, this Federalist Society is the nerve center for a complicated apparatus that does not care much about conservative principles like judicial restraint or originalism or textualism. This Federalist Society is the vehicle for powerful interests which seek not to simply reorder the judiciary but to acquire control of the judiciary to benefit their interests. This third Federalist Society understands the fundamental power of the federal judiciary to rig the system in favor of its donor interests. And as the Kavanaugh confirmation so clearly illustrated, it is willing to go to drastic lengths to secure that power. Um, and again, a history that I'm not, you all I'm sure know this, the Trump administration gave more access to the Federalist Society than any administration previously allowed them to essentially handpick judges and justices um, one quote that I love. So Don McGahn, White House counsel, was an active member of the Federalist Society. He moved into the White House and worked closely with Leonard Leo, vice president of the Federalist Society, to pick judges. And Don McGahn said, our opponents of judicial nominees frequently claim the president has outsourced his selection of judges. That is completely false. I've been a member of the Federalist Society since law school, still am. So frankly, it seems like it's been insourced. I will leave you all to draw your own conclusions about whether outsourcing or insourcing to an external, shadowy, unaccountable, unelected organization is, is a meaningful distinction. Finally, the third group that I think deserves a lot of blame for breaking the civil legal system is the legal profession and particularly the legal elites who have enabled this takeover. As the pro-corporate far-right powers that be have consolidated their strategies, the legal elites have prioritized camaraderie over values. 
So something that Professor Leah Lippman of the University of Michigan has written about for the Drake Law Review, talking about the ways in which elite lawyers fail to hold ourselves accountable, to hold those in our field accountable. Um, as she says, although political polarization makes it difficult for legislators to cooperate across the aisle, the network of elite lawyers still finds common ground with one another. This group likes to be, quote, good sports with one another. Elite circles of the legal profession seem deeply uncomfortable with doing anything that might hold other elite lawyers accountable with, for doing any, uh, for their disregard of various norms or principles. This is true in instances of the degradation of our democracy. It's true in instances of lawyers actively working to violate the rights of, of people of color, of LGBTQ people, of women, of pregnant people. Um, and it's true with the pro-corporate takeover of the judiciary. It's, it's seen as uncouth to talk about it. And so we find ourselves with headlines like those on the right of your screen. So each of these is written by a so-called progressive liberal arguing that actually the Federalist Society judge should be confirmed to the Supreme Court, regardless of the harm that they could cause there, because they are they're good, they are smart and they are well credentialed and they say the right things at the right cocktail parties. And so they deserve to have control over every single one of our lives, virtually every aspect of our lives. Um, you know, many of these are notorious instances. I, I encourage you to read the articles if you're so moved. Um, just kidding, I don't really encourage you to read the articles. I don't think they have a lot of value. I don't think that they make our society meaningfully better. Um, it is a way for elite folks to maintain their power, their position in society, and ultimately to preserve the status quo that's worked out pretty well for them and their corporate clients. Um, I like this series of tweets down at the bottom. Canon is a um, partner of Paul Weiss, which is a major white shoe law firm. Full disclosure, I spent six weeks working there um, and then got out. It, he is a Supreme Court litigant, argues in front of the court frequently, um, and loves to wish all of the justices happy birthday on Twitter. And I think that that's, it makes my skin crawl, right? It's people who don't recognize the stakes of what is happening here, who treat this all as a game, as an academic exercise, as a backslapping organization, um, backslapping operation of, of political elite legal insiders. And again, I cannot stress enough that the people suffer as a result. I also have included a picture of my lovely alma mater, which I think has done more harm than almost any other institution in this country to promote this notion that you can't hold lawyers accountable for what they do. You can't criticize lawyers for the people that they represent. And you have to accept the world that the legal elites have made for us all. So, these are the entities that I posit that I argue are the problem. In the abstract, I think they're bad. I think they sound bad. I hope maybe you find that compelling. But what I'd love to take the next couple of minutes to focus on is what the consequences are. How does this impact real people? Why should any of us care? And from my perspective, there are two key impacts. The first is that people can't get into a courtroom anymore. For a whole swath of the American public, the judiciary is not an accessible branch of government. They might be wrong, they might have a claim, they might have had their rights violated, but they cannot even make it into the front door of a courtroom. And two, if they get in, they're going to lose. This hurts workers, it hurts consumers, it hurts the rule of law. When whole groups of people no longer have the protection of the legal system, I question what the legal system's purpose is and if it is truly serving that purpose. So there are a million examples that I could use, but one that I think really showcases the, the role of pro-corporate forces in rigging the civil legal system is forced arbitration. Some of you may be very familiar with this, in which case, forgive me, um, some of you might be newer to forced arbitration. It's it's a really small term in a lot of consumer and employment contracts, and I never read my full contracts, and I doubt many people here read them, and it's really easy to not have paid attention to the fact that you've signed away a lot of your rights in these contracts. So I have some numbers up here about the number of individuals who are subjected to forced arbitration. 
the disproportionate impact that it has on low wage workers, black workers, women, Hispanic workers. Um, and then on the right, you can see a quote from a former employee of Buffalo Wild Wings who really is showcasing the ramifications of forced arbitration for him, for herself and her coworkers. So quick overview, arbitration, it's a private process. It's sort of an, um, a privatized legal system is what people call it. It's a private process where disputing parties can um, agree that an arbitrator, one or several individuals, not appointed by a court of law, not elected, not you know, appointed by the president, but private individuals can make a decision about the dispute. They might hear evidence, they might hear arguments, but they don't have to follow the rules that regular judges have to follow. Their opinions aren't public, they don't have to follow precedent. Um, so there might be some aspects that replicate a courtroom, but the protections that exist for the parties in front of them are nowhere near the protections that you see in a courtroom. So that's arbitration, fine. Add forced in front of it, and I think you see where this is going. This is powerful entities forcing employees, um, workers and consumers to sign contracts saying that those, worker, those workers and consumers can no longer go to court when they've been harmed, that they have to go into this privatized legal system where um, the American Association for Justice has found that you are more likely to be struck by lightning than prevail in a claim that you have brought. So at this point, more than 60 million workers have lost their right to sue their employer in public court if they're fired, if they're harassed, if they have their wages stolen. Um, you, every single consumer in the country has signed a consumer arbitration agreement. There's something close to a billion consumer arbitration agreements signed every year or that are in force every year. Um, it, you know, so that means that on average, the average American has signed many of them every year. And, you know, I, I think about what this means for people who experience potentially a small amount of harm, but the companies are able to benefit significantly. So in the consumer context, I think about if Netflix was skimming a dollar extra off each month. Well, you're probably not going to go into this privatized legal system to arbitrate over the $12 that you've lost over the course of a year. But the company, if they're doing that to everybody, is able to profit massively. Same goes with wage theft, employers stealing from workers. Same goes with a whole other host of harms. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna just quickly run through the history of forced arbitration and kind of the role that the judiciary, the corporate judiciary has played in creating this regime of forced arbitration. So the original law, the Federal Arbitration Act was passed in 1925. The goal of that law was to help businesses, two parties on equal footing in contract negotiations, resolve disputes between themselves in an efficient, cheap way, freeing up US courtrooms for non-corporate parties, for real people. But starting in the 1980s, you'll note just some 10, 10 years or so, a decade after the Powell memo first came out, the Supreme Court started rewriting this law. So in 1985, the Supreme Court heard Mitsubishi Motors and decided that the Federal Arbitration Act didn't just apply to dis disputes over what was in the contract, but it required arbitration of statutory claims. So if one party to a contract said, well, you stole my wages, which is illegal under the law, doesn't matter, you've sent an arbitration clause, you have to arbitrate that, even if you know, separate from the terms of the contract. In 2001, the court decided that the Federal Arbitration Act could be applied to workers who are forced to sign that clause by their employers. So no longer just business to business as the law was intended when passed by our democratically elected representatives. But, um, you know, all of a sudden you have a huge power disparity. Well, that's not a problem, says the court in 2001. In 2011, in a, a kind of core case, AT&T v. Concepcion, um, the court said that class-wide arbitration, so a whole group of wronged individuals bringing their claims together um, in arbitration wasn't allowed, that this was a individual process. You could not join your claims. You couldn't do sort of a class action equivalent in the arbitration space. Then in American Express v. Italian Colors in 2013, the court said that even if 
the existence of an arbitration clause meant that there was no effective remedy for workers or consumers, that because of the cost of arbitration versus the amount that could be recovered and the, you know, the lack of likelihood that you would recover anything, that there was essentially no way to claim your rights. Well, didn't matter. Too bad. Sorry. I guess you're out of luck. Turning the arbitration system into essentially a claim disposal system. That is the number one impact is that people don't even try to bring cases anymore because they are not going to win in arbitration. The consequences of this, when corporations hurt workers and consumers, when they cheat, steal, break the law, cases that should be heard by a judge or by a jury are put into this secret system controlled that's often, and we can talk about this later, controlled by the wrongdoers. There's no right to go to court, no right to a jury, no right to a written record, no right to discovery, no transparency, no legal precedent, no opportunity for group actions, no guarantee of an adjudicator with legal expertise and no meaningful judicial review. This means that companies can get away with hurting all of us, decimating or destroying our society, and there's effectively no way to hold them accountable. And this is the world that our corporate Supreme Court has built. And this is the world that workers and consumers find themselves in. The story isn't over. Um, the Economic Policy Institute estimates that by 2024, 80% of non-union workers will be subjected to forced arbitration clauses. Corporations are working every single day to get around any, any path forward that states or plaintiff's attorneys have found to try to effectively vindicate people's rights. Um, we certainly have not heard the end of this story. And like I said, this, this story could be told a million times over. I am... This is just so much to talk about. I'm gonna like fly through the next slides. Um, judges, if you do make it inside of a courtroom, the vast majority of judges are former corporate partners or former prosecutors. There's a great report put out by Dr. Joanna Shepard of I believe Emory University in partnership with the organization Demand Justice looking at what are the implications of having all of these corporate attorneys on the bench? Well, shocker, they're anti-worker. They're anti-consumer. Um, there is a, you know, so we've got a problem with judges. We've got a problem with the law school to corporate law pipeline in which we see that the vast majority, it's the people in blue here, go into private practice when they graduate from law school. There are many structural reasons for that, right? It's often not really an individual choice because people have crushing debt. People are told that this is politically neutral. They're, they're pushed in that direction by their law schools. But wow, is the price of that huge for our country when you have the best lawyers that money can buy representing corporate America in front of judges that are predisposed to side with the wealthy and the powerful at the expense of everyday people. Is anybody trying to do anything about this? Great question. Um, I love this quote from an Atlantic article that came out earlier this year uh, about the progressive response to the judicial to the capture of the judiciary, but well oiled the progressive machine was not, um, which I think is true in many, many instances. A couple of things I want to point to here. One is the fact that even in progressive legal organizations, their boards often have corporate attorneys on them. The Constitutional Accountability Center, a wonderful organization has Andrew Pincus, who's argued many of the cases in support of forced arbitration as their board chair. American Constitution Society, founded to be the progressive counterpart to the Federalist Society, had an Amazon vice president on their board, even as Amazon was engaging in extensive union busting efforts, mistreating workers all over the place. We see that progressive voters are not motivated by the courts, and that's because they are not told that this matters. They are not getting the cue to care about this from, from the leadership of the party. Um, we have legal elites like Noah Feldman saying that you shouldn't have an opinion on who's on the Supreme Court or if a Supreme Court justice should retire if you can't tell them that privately. You shouldn't make that call publicly. You should tell Justice Breyer, for example, to retire behind the scenes. Who has access to having lunch with Justice Breyer? Certainly not me. Certainly not 99.9% .9 of Americans but we deserve to have a say in what happens in an entire third of our government as well. So what do we do when we're 50 years too late? This is what I'm working on now. This is what a number of organizations and activists are thinking about. 
how do we engage on these issues? How do we galvanize a new generation of law students and lawyers to take responsibility for what our profession has done? How do we stop the hoarding of knowledge and information by legal elites and expand the universe of people who are engaged on the courts? How do we bring a courts-oriented lens to all progressive organizing, to everybody who's at a worker center, to everybody who's fighting for economic justice, everybody who's fighting for a Green New Deal? How do we ensure that courts and the role of the courts are centered in all of that? Um, it's, it's a huge question. I don't have answers, so I'm glad we're out of time. Um, but that's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. It's, it's an uphill battle. This needed to happen 50 years ago on the left, and it didn't. Um, the consequences are immense, but, but all we can do is try. So with that, I will end. Oh, well, Molly, um, I just crawled back out from under my desk right in time to see you put on your glasses when you say, what do we do you do about this? So I was like, all right, stand back. Um, that was really, um, amazing. And as somebody who has been involved in work, um, around the judiciary through through my relationship with QSide, there was <clears throat> it sort of provided a really interesting macro historical lens of kind of where we're coming from. Um, so just thank you so much for that. I think this is going to be super interesting to our our members um, who are here and who aren't. And to be honest, we're probably going to make this required beauty, viewing for the folks working on our datathon, because I think it provides a lot of the context around the just fair work that we're doing, um, which you know we've had some conversations about um, in the past. So we do have a couple of questions, so I, I wanna um, uh, get to them. So uh, one of our attendees asked, um, they said they're particularly interested in the People Parodies Project work advocating for law clerks facing harassment in the judiciary. One of the many barriers facing law clerks who would like to take legal action against judges is the difficulty of accessing, accessing affordable skilled legal counsel who are willing to go up against those powerful judges, which, you know, is very interesting, right? Because they may then have to stand in front of that judge's bench at some point. Um, how can the legal profession increase access to legal representation for law clerks? Nice bite-sized question. Um, <laughs> so for folks who haven't been following this as closely, and I think most of our work on this issue thus far has focused on the federal court. So I'll Keep my focus there, although there's a whole conversation to be had about harassment and discrimination in the state courts. There are 30,000 employees of the federal judiciary. So that's law clerks, which is usually a one to two year position after you graduate from law school working closely with a judge. There's federal defenders are all employees of the federal judiciary. So federal public defenders, court reporters, um, kind of most people who work in a federal courthouse are employees of a federal judiciary. So this is a massive segment of the workforce. Those 30,000 workers do not have the same legal protections as you or I in our day jobs. They aren't protected by federal civil rights law. They aren't protected by Title VII. They are completely exempt because the judiciary said they can police themselves. No worries, Congress. We got it. If anybody saw the blockbuster Wall Street Journal report a couple of days ago, um, there's been massive issues of judges refusing to, failing to recuse themselves from cases where they have a personal financial stake. Um, there's been accusations, accusations of insider dealing. The judiciary cannot police itself. They have failed to do that. And one of the ways in which that has surfaced in recent years is a number of law clerks, um, people like Heidi Bond, Leah Lippman, um, Olivia Warren, who have spoken out about the harassment that they experienced in chambers. Um, it, horrific, horrific harassment. Um, it's a situation that's ripe for abuse, in part because of the lack of federal protections, in part because of the really, really awful reporting system. Um, a reporting system that, as was, as was just said, right, like puts people, puts people at the mercy of the people who control the judiciary who you will be working with and operating in front of for the rest of your career. So the system is broken. Um, I think that the question of how to make sure that there are advocates for those folks is critical. But I think that there's actually the first question I would ask is how do we reform the system? 
this isn't working. And no matter how skilled of an advocate you have working on your behalf, the reporting mechanisms that we have aren't working. The processes have completely failed. There's litigation on this right now, uh, Jane Rowe, who's suing the judiciary because she, as a federal defender, experienced immense harassment and the system was built to protect her harassers and not her. So at PPP, we're supporting legislation right now, the Judiciary Accountability Act, which was introduced over the summer, which would rewrite the reporting system, reconceptualize what your rights are and what the processes available to you are if you are one of those 30,000 employees of the federal judiciary. So I'm sorry, I don't think that was a great answer, but the JAA, I think, is our best hope at this point. Really interesting. Um, I wasn't aware that that was such a problem, but it's shocking, but not surprising. Um, you know, if, if that makes sense, I feel like that's this new phrase that we've all had to sort of like keep at the back of our throats constantly over the last five years. Apparently the last 50 years, I just wasn't aware of it for most of that time. Um, one thing I'll just take a point of personal privilege to say that I really appreciate about your talk. And this is something that many, several of us within sort of um, the work that we've done as a QSide community around the judiciary, and we're continuing to scale up, we have really experienced the kind of the visceral response that can come from um, that sort of, for lack of a better word, that old boys network, right? Um, you know, when we have released very scientifically rigorous analysis of bias in the courts, there has been really a, a sort of communal circling of the wagons um, and around that in, in ways that are very aggressive, um, uh, almost shockingly uh, uh, aggressive. Um, and what's at the core of it is not a kind of a, a critique of our methods or a critique of our findings, but a critique of our audacity to ask the question, to question that system. Like when you really peel it back. And that has been a sort of through line on our side as, as sort of social justice advocates looking at data around this. I guess I'm gonna take a point of personal privilege and ask one of my questions. So your superpowers are understanding the judiciary understanding the history and sort of advocating for what it comes from the law side. Our superpowers are using data to expose truths. What do you need from people like us? What's the thing that we can use our superpowers to do to help people like you achieve your vision? Love the question. Um, love the concept of superpowers. Like <laughs> They're not my superpowers, just to be clear. I sort of represent the superpowers of everybody in the attendee list. I, I'm not a mathematician at all, so I'm not a data scientist. But. So what comes to mind for me is thinking about things like the report that I referenced briefly that Dr. Shepard put out about what are the implications for litigants of having a pro-corporate bench, of having a federal judiciary that is chock full of law firm partners and prosecutors. Um, because I think that it's, you can point to individual cases, right? We can point to the forced arbitration cases. We can say, well, golly gee, like aren't there some pretty bad decisions at the Supreme Court? But what gets lost in the shuffle is the district court decisions, the state court decisions, the appellate court decisions in which workers and consumers, the vast majority of them are never gonna make it to the Supreme Court. They're not gonna be a headline in the newspaper for better or for worse, but they're not. And so I think that the scale of the problem, it, it can be so hard to quantify it. And anybody who knows numbers, which is very few people who have gone to law school, um, I think that trying to figure out how to measure the impact for workers and consumers, how to measure the lost power, the lost wages, the lost Monet, you know, how many fewer dollars are in the pockets of the average worker or consumer as a result of what the Supreme Court, the lower courts have done? If somebody can answer that, I'd be thrilled. Hmm. All right. So it is 501. Uh, could I, is, is, can I, can we do one last quick question? Do you have the set? Do you have the flexibility? I want to be, thank you so much. So I'm going to um, uh, uh, bring up Laura's question. Um, thank you for that, Laura. So uh, it says, what do you think the best 
angle of approach for changes given the entanglements of the system. I'm thinking specifically that many advising the efforts to change the federal court system have large conflicts of interest because their careers benefit from the current court system as it currently functions, i.e. law professors having their law review articles, citing by SCOTUS Court of Appeals seems very important, student clerkship placement, et cetera. So to me, it seems like even if there's a public pressure from places like Demand Justice, it seems there's a large void of professional support for change in academia, absent Nico Boy, Bowie, the SS women, et cetera. Do you think academic support is necessary? Sorry, this is so long. Please don't apologize, Laura. I learned 12 things just reading your, uh, your question. Thank you. Laura, I love the question. Um, first of all, just shout out to Nico, who's on our board and really is at the vanguard of this within the academy. Um, the Strict Scrutiny women, love them. Fangirl, huge fan. Um, so a couple of things. Like, I think you're totally right that, look, if you're, with a few exceptions, including people who are on our advisory council, like if you're a Supreme Court litigator, we're probably not going to convince you that actually this whole system is fundamentally flawed and needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. If you're a tenured faculty member at a law school and have been there for 30 years, like again, maybe we can get you, but it's going to be pretty hard. Our theory of change is that it has to start just frankly like the Federalist Society did it with the incoming generation of law students and lawyers. So you have to build that community when people first get onto campus, you have to give them space to challenge the dominant thinking, to challenge the status quo, and then support them throughout their career so that they maintain that community so that they connect with the folks in the field who are like-minded, who will support them as they push back on systems of power um, rather than encouraging them to acquiesce to systems of power. And then, and then hope that those people eventually get into academia, that they join the Nikos and the Leah Lippmans of the world. But some of this is it's just going to be a really long game. And I think that um, it's, it's like devastating and it's why it's really hard to get out of bed in the morning because the harm is happening now. The, the ramifications of all this are happening right now. And to successfully challenge it, we're going to have to organize for years. We're going to have to organize for decades. And, and how you hold those two truths is really, really, I think, can be overwhelming. And also, it's our only option. Like, what other choice do we have? Um, we're not going to fix all this tomorrow. Hopefully, Congress like does something, anything, um, and gets us some immediate relief. But if we want to fundamentally change this, we have to be in it for the long haul. And we have to be thinking about not just who's in the legal academy now, but who will be there tomorrow, who will be there 15 years from now, and how do we make sure that they're of a different mold than the folks that we see right now? Sorry to put all of like my sadness onto you. Um, well, um, I feel your sadness and hope that you feel supported by us. This work is hard. It, it's hard, um, and I hear that and want to make space for that, um, but please um, keep going and let our community know how we can support your community, because this, this work is hard. Um, I think all of us who are engaged in it, it, it is really hard. So um, I, I just want to spend the last moment here thanking um, Molly for uh, joining us today. This is incredibly illuminating. Um, and I think we all have a lot of work to do. So thank you so much. It's just absolutely amazing um, talk. Um, for those of you who uh, have the flexibility in your schedule and the interest, um, uh, we have posted the link. Uh, it to the cocktail hour. We will uh, close out of here in just a minute. We'll give everybody a chance, but now's the moment. Grab that link um, and that'll be a standard Zoom room and we can chit chat over there for a few minutes more if you have that time. Um, remember, if you have not yet done so, please do uh, uh, register for the Datathon for Justice. Tell your friends and family and uh, all of the folks in your orbit. One of the projects we will be working on at the Datathon is looking at judicial uh, sentencing outcomes um, in the state of Minnesota, which Molly and, uh, Molly and Chad and I all share um, a, a, a home down advantage. 
we'll be working on that. And uh, we really appreciate your time and uh, being here today. Two weeks from today, we um, have one of the co-founders of Project Zero, which will be um, speaking to us. So please make sure to register for that colloquium event as well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.